Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Dr. Kerry Gell, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country, sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you like our interviews, press like and subscribe. Also leave comments. This helps us continue to bring great interviews. According to the American Foundation for the Blind, 21% of Americans believe that losing their vision would have a greater negative impact on their quality of life than cancer, heart disease, or any other health condition. Macular degeneration, or AMD, is a leading cause of blindness in people over the age of 55. New research shows macular degeneration is mostly a lifestyle disease and could be slowed or even stopped if caught early enough. Today's guest, Optometric physician, Dr. Jeff Gerson, has dedicated his life to preventing this blinding disease. Dr. Gerson is the Optometric Medical Director of the Macular Degeneration Association, dedicated to AMD research and education. Before entering private practice in Kansas, Dr. Gerson was a faculty member at the University of Kansas School of Medicine, Department of Ophthalmology. Dr. Gerson has authored numerous articles and lectures internationally. Welcome, Dr. Gerson. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, we certainly appreciate you being here. So let's start off with what is AMD or macular degeneration? Yeah, so I think to state it most basically, uh, the first thing is to realize that AMD, the A stands for age. So it's an age-related disease process. So age-related macular degeneration is when our macula, which is kind of the very central part and the back inside part of our eye, starts to degenerate, just like we have many other uh, degenerative diseases in our body, like arthritis or so many other things, we start to have some change and degeneration in that part of our eye. And what makes it so significant is that's the part of our eye that we use for our fine detailed vision. So when you look right at somebody's face, right at their nose, and the macula is what's giving you the fine detail on their nose. You may be able to see everything around it, but the macula is what gives you that very central point. It's often thought that macular degeneration is an epidemic. Would you consider it an epidemic? You know, I, I think it, it really is. I, I think it's, it's really an unrecognized epidemic and, and really kind of uh, under, undervalued, not undervalued, but we, people don't realize how much of it there really is. You know, historically, if you ask people, you know, is anyone in your family that's had macular degeneration, a lot of my patients don't know. They'll say, well, mom or dad had an eye problem. They didn't know what it was. And I think we're just now, you know, maybe in the last 10, 15 years, gotten to where technology is good enough, doctors are paying enough attention to start to find it in the true numbers that there are. Um, but, you know, and I think we'll go into this a little bit later, but just, just with working with my patients, the percentage of people that have it, is far more than what I ever would have expected. There was an article in one of the ophthalmology journals that macular degeneration is a systemic vascular disease. Can you explain why they think that and how it's related to other parts of the body as far as the vascular system? Yeah, so what's really, it's a great question. So what's really interesting about that is, so I'll kind of skip ahead to, to tell you what I talk to patients about. And what I tell my patients with macular degeneration is there's five things they really need to be paying attention to. And so number one is a healthy diet with more green leafy vegetables and less refined carbohydrates. Number two, they need to engage in some exercise or at least be active. Number three, they need to not smoke. And number four, they need to try to maintain something close to an ideal body weight and not be obese. The fifth one is an eye specific vitamin. But what I talk to my patients about is those first four things that I mentioned are the exact same things that any doctor you've gone to in the last 10 years has said to you, whether you ask about blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, anything, 
it's all the same things. So the same inflammation in our body that causes all these other conditions is ultimately part of the root cause of macular degeneration. So macular degeneration, the root cause we think is inflammatory, oxidative stress. Can you explain what that means? Yeah, so basically what that means, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different things around it. Uh, one of the issues is that with light coming into our eyes, our eyes require a lot of energy to process that. And part of the, the processing, what happens is, is we have this oxidative stress, the stress that's created, and we have oxidation. And oxidation, the way to think of that is um, if you take a, um, an apple and you cut an apple in half and it starts to brown, it's oxidizing. And so kind of the same thing is what's happening to the cells in our retina and our macula over time with overuse. And so you'd already, you know, so we've already kind of mentioned oxidation antioxidants can potentially help protect against that. So if we talk about free radicals, yeah. what are free radicals and how does that uh, relate to uh, inflammation and oxidative stress? If we look at it, there's like a cycle with inflammation and oxidative stress and how do they relate to each other and how do they cause damage within the body and macular degeneration itself? Yeah, so, so it's the oxidation that, that's causing these free radicals. And so, you know, it has to do with electrons and electrons pairing. There's all this very scientific explanation to it. But basically, when we have this oxidation, this kind of rusting process or this browning of the apple process, we're developing these free radicals. And so what then can happen is antioxidants can come and kind of attach onto those free radicals and neutralize them. And so that's why you hear so much about antioxidants and vitamins because of the potential for different vitamins and different supplements, minerals, to be able to basically counteract the free radicals, the oxidation that's happening. So if we want to diagnose disease or the spectrum of disease as early as possible. So the earlier we could diagnose something or know if somebody's on the spectrum, the better the outcomes could, would be. So what, if we look at macular degeneration, what is the earliest subclinical signs or symptoms that a patient may have? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And so again, I'll kind of go around to get to your answer, but I, the reason I think it's such a great question is because so oftentimes what I hear from people is, you know, when I ask them questions about their vision, they'll say, well, I don't see very well the drive at night, but that's just because I'm getting older. Or I don't do this or I can't do that, it's just because I'm getting older. And what I'm really adamant with my patients about is getting older does not cause you to have poor vision. Getting older may make you more likely to have age-related eye problems. And so then my job as your eye doctor is to figure out which one of those age-related eye problems you have and not just pawn it off to age because age doesn't cause poor vision. So the reason I point all that out is oftentimes the first symptom of macular degeneration is not seeing well at night or in dark or especially going from a bright room to a dark room. So going from outside to a lobby into a movie theater and taking a long time to adapt to that. So that's recognized as one of, if not the first symptom of macular degeneration. And there's actually a test that can be done in, in, in the office to actually be able to very objectively look at how long it takes someone to adapt from bright light to dark. <clears throat> so that's really the earliest way to be able to diagnose what's called subclinical macular degeneration. So what that term means is, we're finding it before you can see it. So to your point, we think with macular degeneration, just like in virtually any other condition, that the earlier we find it, then the earlier we can propose and, and, and start some form of intervention. And then ideally we can prevent uh, vision loss or vision change. So yeah, so testing someone's dark adaptation is what it's called is the earliest way to find subclinical macular degeneration. Now, if you go over the different types of macular de degeneration, dry and wet, and are they a continuation of each other? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's a good question. So the, the really the, the easiest way to explain it is just, it's really in the terminology. So the dry kind is changes of atrophy, whereas the wet kind is where there's abnormal blood vessels that bleed. And what patients oftentimes ask is, well, do I have the good kind or the bad kind? And the reality is there's really no good kind of macular degeneration. The only good kind is when you catch it really early, 
before it's bothering you and we can do something about it. So are they a continuum? So in dry macular degeneration, there's a, a number of different levels or stages that, that eye doctors use to classify what level it's at. And the different levels of dry macular degeneration are continu a continuum. Uh, there's kind of an end stage of dry macular degeneration where it becomes very atrophic. And there's really just big, big kind of chunks of the macula that are no longer functioning. And that actually by genetics is a little bit different um, and is different than the people that develop wet macular degeneration. So although it all appears to be a, a continuum of the same process, Genetically, there's differences between the end stage of dry macular degeneration and of wet macular degeneration. That's an interesting point when we bring about, talk about genetics, because before 1900, there was almost no cardiovascular disease, cancer, macular degeneration. So what has changed over the last 100 or so years? Has our genetics changed, or why, do, why are we getting these chronic degenerative diseases? Yeah, so, you know, has our genetics changed? Maybe a little, but probably not enough to, um, to explain the, dr the dramatic change in all these chronic diseases that you're mentioning. And, you know, I, I think what, what I would tell you, I think, and what a lot of literature really backs up is it really has to do with lifestyle, changes in lifestyle. That as, in general, as a society, we're not as active. We don't eat as well. Um, the foods that we eat aren't even of the same quality that they were 100 years ago. So, you know, if you took vegetables that were grown in the field 100 years ago and compared the nutrients that are, were in them compared to the nutrients that are grown in the same field today, there, it, because of over farming, there's far less nutrition in it. So it, it's lifestyle and some of the changes that have occurred over time, basically because of that lifestyle, that's really driving these chronic diseases. Now, macular degeneration, according to the studies, is really underdiagnosed. And why do you think it's underdiagnosed? Now that our technology and eye care, you know, eye doctors have this incredible technology to be able to view the macular in microns, why are we still underdiagnosing it? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, so you're right. There was a, a publication about three years ago that really pointed this out. And what this publication said was, what they did was they went out to eye doctors, optometrists and ophthalmologists, and said, we want you to examine patients over the age of 60, and all we want you to do is tell us, do they have macular degeneration, yes or no? And then, by the way, take a picture of the inside of their eye so that we can judge you. So basically, doctors were said, all you got to do is one thing, and big brother's watching over your shoulder, so you better try and do a good job. Even with those instructions, about 25% of the time, macular degeneration was missed. So that's, that's the study you're referring to, and it, it really was astounding when it was published. And so the realities of everyday practice is that when we're seeing patients, we're not being asked just one singular question. We're being asked dozens, if not hundreds of questions. You know, are there cataracts? Is there glaucoma? Do they need glasses? And all these things. And so I think that oftentimes subtleties are missed. I think that, you know, right or wrong, I think that's what's happening is subtleties are very oftentimes missed and oftentimes advanced technology is not being employed to help get the answer. And so I think that's what's, that's what's leading to it. And, um, but it, it, it really is, it's real, it's a big deal. And because as we, already, as we already discussed, the earlier you find something, the better chance you have of having really good outcomes. Let's talk about advanced technology, about retinal photography, retinal imaging, to be able to pick up subtle changes of the macula. What, what, what is out there that uh, the eye physician has at their, disposable, at their disposal to be able to do a better job to help find these very early changes of the macula? Yeah, so Carrie, I think you and I have probably been practicing about the same amount of time, and, and the advances in technology have just been so incredible what we have at our disposal today versus not too long ago. And so where I start with that is every patient that I see over age 60, I test their dark adaptation, what we were mentioning earlier. And so for my patients over 60, that's not a choice. That's just part of the deal. That's part of what we do because I know that that's the most sensitive way to be able to pick up macular degeneration. So for me, that's number one. But some of the other technologies that are used, you mentioned retinal photography. 
So, you know, imagine taking a picture of yourself or of your family. What we have the capability of doing is taking a picture of the inside of your eye. And so it gives us a stationary, high resolution, manipulatable image to be able to take a very close look. And then I think the, uh, and there's, there's different types of retinal photography. Some of the different imaging units give us, use different modes, multimodal. So it essentially is able to give us different layers. So it's not just a, even though it's just a flat image, it's able to dissect the different layers of the retina. And then another really big one is something called OCT, ocular coherence tomography. And the way that I describe that to patients is it's like having an ultra fine, uh, fine tuned ultrasound. So it's so fine tuned that it's able to see things that are two, three, four microns in size to be able to see, are there some of the subtle changes that could be from macular degeneration or something else? And I think those are, for me at least, those are the main technologies for detecting macular degeneration. Um, there's all sorts of even lower tech technologies. So even things like checking what's called your contrast sensitivity. Are you able to see things that aren't necessarily black and white or shades of gray? It's not as sensitive, but oftentimes people with macular degeneration have subtle changes to their vision that are important to pick up. Let's talk about how common macular degeneration, the epidemiology within the U.S., uh, you know, worldwide. Yeah. So again, just speaking from my experience um, in, in doing a clinical study on this. So in patients, I did a study of 100 consecutive patients that were over age 60 that I thought everything looked normal on their clinical exam. I even did the OCT, the instrument that I mentioned earlier, and that was normal. 40% of them failed the dark adaptation testing. So that means 40% of my patients over 60 that look like everything's normal actually have subclinical or very, very early macular degeneration. And what we know is as we get older, odds go up. And so my numbers of 40% were of all my patients above age 60. And so if we were to break it down into different age groups, we'd find that you know, 60 to 70 is lower than 70 to 80, which is lower than 80 to 100. So I would contend that any of the published numbers as far as prevalence of macular degeneration far underreported because there's so many people that are being missed. And the key thing is what can we do about it? But we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Let's talk about some of the other signs of some of the other technology like retinal photography. Uh, if you have multispectral imaging or one of these technologies that you could pick up and, and you could look at the retina in microns, 10 microns, 15 microns. One of the earliest signs is something called Drusen. Explain what Drusen is and how, how that's important, not only in macular degeneration, but it also may be a sign of other systemic disease. Yeah, so Drusen are these little buildups that accumulate in the retina. And so what happens in very, very early macular degeneration is we get deposits in a couple different layers of cholesterol-like material. And what basically creates these deposits is when we don't have good in and out flow in and out of the retina. And then we start getting these little deposits of it's essentially almost like waste material, metabolic waste. And so we get these little deposits that then start to grow. And so they start out just pinpoint, tiny, tiny, tiny. And then they start getting a little bit larger, a little bit larger until we can ultimately then see them clinically. And so these drusen can accumulate can eventually lead to some decrease in vision, whether it's your contrast sensitivity or how big or small is something you could see. But again, as I mentioned, a part of these deposits are accumulation of cholesterol. So as we can imagine, it has, you know, that has something to do with cholesterol, has something to do with systemic care. So yeah, it, it really is all related. You know, the, the blood that flows through the eyes is the same as the blood that flows through the rest of the body. And so we can't, we, or we, we, really, we need to assume that when there's inflammation or disease or illness elsewhere, that we're much more likely to have the same in the eye. You know, what I always tell people is sick eyes generally happen in sick people. And so if you see sick eyes, then we need to really look harder systemically and see what else is going on, whether our patients know about it or not. The technologies we use, the, taking photographs of the back of the eye, of the macular, of the retina, sometimes we'll see little pigment changes, pigment yeah. stacking, 
Well, how, how does that relate to macular degeneration? And what does that mean to the optometric physician? Yeah, so, you know, I think that's another one of the underappreciated signs of macular degeneration. It's so important to pick up even subtle age-related pigmentary changes. So part of the retina itself has 10 layers, or at least that's how we traditionally think of it. And part of those 10 layers, part of it's made up of pigmentation. And so what can happen in macular degeneration is this pigmentation, instead of being a nice even coating and really being how it's supposed to be, it gets kind of clumped up. And so sometimes we see areas where there's clumps of too much pigment. And sometimes we'll also see corresponding areas where the pigment has migrated away from. So there's less pigmentation. And so that's something we really need to be aware of because people that have changes in their pigmentation are actually usually at higher risk of their AMD getting worse or becoming the wet kind than those that just have drusen. So even subtle pigment changes put somebody at very, very high risk. Now, one of the other tests that we do also is advanced color vision. How could color vision help us with helping with early diagnosis of macular degeneration? Yeah, and you know, I like how you put that, uh, where you say more advanced color vision testing because um, we're, un we're not that likely to find color vision changes on the traditional book where we flip the pages and there's you know, 10 pages and ask you what number do you see. We're not nearly as likely to find deficits there as we are in some of the more advanced color vision testing, some of the digital versions. Um, because what happens is, um, depending on what cells in the eye start to become damaged, it can affect our color vision and it can affect the type of change to our color vision. So whether it's a change to the blues and yellows or the reds and greens, that can lead us in one direction or another. And you know, I think one of the really important things about how you're asking these questions is to realize that macular degeneration, like so many other things, is a puzzle with so many pieces. And so what, you're, what, what we're doing here is we're just laying out what are some or you know, many of the different pieces. And the more pieces of the puzzle that you have, I think the better off you are to be able to make a diagnosis and I think at least as important as making a diagnosis is being able to follow somebody over time, right? Because to me, it's not good enough just to say, well, you have macular degeneration. What I need to be able to do is to make a diagnosis, create a, a plan for what we're going to do about it. And then when you come back, be able to assess whether that plan seems to be working or not. So the more of these technologies that your eye doctor has at their disposal, the better you are, better off you are or they are for really tracking things over time. So let's talk about risk factors. What are some of the main risk factors that would make somebody at greater risk for getting macular degeneration? Yeah, so as far as risk factors, I think they need to be broken down into two main categories. The first one are those that are modifiable, and the second one is those that are not modifiable. And so actually, let me talk real briefly about the ones that are not modifiable first. So the two big ones that are not modifiable are age. So the older you are, the greater risk you are. So what I tell my patients is I, I hope your risk increases because that means you're getting older. And then the second one is that's not modifiable, at least not yet, is genetics. So if you have a parent or parents or other family members that have macular degeneration, that generally puts you at greater risk. Um, and that's just asking about family history. There's further genetics that can be done beyond just a family history, but just even knowing that helps us to determine some risk. So those are the non-modifiable. As far as what's modifiable, you know, it kind of goes back to, I mentioned this earlier, you could probably ask the same question about heart disease or diabetes. You know, what are the modifiable things that are risk factors? And so it's all the common players like smoking, which is probably the, the biggest modifiable risk factor is smoking. And what's really amazing is the vast majority of people that have macular degeneration didn't know that smoking was bad for their eyes and were never told that they should consider to quit smoking. The vast majority. So there's surveys that have been done on this and it's in the 90s as far as percentile that don't know that it's important and haven't been told they should quit. So smoking is, is a risk factor. Poor diet, obesity, uh, uncontrolled systemic health issues. So even like um, poorly controlled or uncontrolled hypertension is a further risk factor. Um, it, again, it's just a, it's a lot of the same things as so many systemic diseases. 
Another emerging one that there's really some question about is blue light exposure or, or different types of light exposure. And whether that's a risk factor or not, there's no harm in protecting ourselves. And so of all, all these risk factors are things that are fairly easily addressed with virtually no downside, right? No doctor is going to say that it's a bad idea to be of ideal body weight, control your blood pressure, exercise, have a healthy diet, um, and wear sunglasses or protect your eyes when you're on a computer. No one's going to, no one would ever argue against any of those things. So anything that really causes inflammation, really, will put you at risk for one of the inf chronic inflammatory diseases, inflammation being the core component of chronic disease, whether we're eating a very high glycemic uh, diet, a very high in sugar, or we take certain, uh, certain medications that may put us at risk. Uh, so we have to really work, we have to watch what causes, what causes inflammation. You know, Carrie, I'm glad you brought up the high glycemic diet um, because that's it's a, it's a it's it's a really important point. So, a study that many people may have heard of or see on the labels of vitamins is something called the age-related eye disease study. And so, from that study uh, came a specific vitamin formulation to prevent conversion from the dry kind to the wet kind of macular degeneration. And with the right vitamin formulation, we could decrease the risk by about 25%. Well, interestingly, in the same study, in the papers that were published later, not the initial one, but later, they found that by changing the glycemic index of your diet could have as much benefit as taking the right vitamin. So, you know, what I think what people looked at vitamins for is an easy answer, right? It's much, it's much easier to just take a vitamin than it is to change your diet and to eat healthier. The reason I say healthier is because what I've learned is I can't just tell people you need to have a healthy diet because to some people, a healthy diet means eat fast food less. That doesn't, but in your eyes and my eyes, that's not a healthy diet. To us, a healthy diet probably means eating more fruits, eating more vegetables, eating uh, lean proteins if you eat, if you eat uh, animal products, eating those kinds of right foods, not just less of the bad foods. How about alcohol or insomnia? Those also cause inflammation. Yeah, yeah, they, they can play a big part also. So um, poor sleep, there's, uh, so it's interesting. So uh, at one of our big national meetings, American Academy of Optometry meeting, I think it was three years ago, a colleague of ours and I, Dr. Paul Chaus, put together a talk on basically sleep disorders. What are they and what do they mean as far as our eyes are concerned? And so I really kind of dove into that topic and really found just all the different ways that poor sleep hygiene really affects our eyes, whether it's glaucoma or macular degeneration or being part of, of the issue with diabetes and the problems that come with that. But yeah, we definitely know that poor sleep hygiene is an issue that ideally if someone gets eight-ish, seven to eight hours of sleep, one of the interesting things that I learned was that too much sleep can potentially be as damaging as not enough sleep. Um, so I think that you know too much of a good thing is not always a good thing. Um, and then alcohol is, is really, it's, it's a really interesting one because there's studies on both sides of that. And there have been some studies that show that small amounts of alcohol can potentially be beneficial and not harmful. Um, but the, the issue there is the issue of the moderation. Um, because any of the studies that talk about any potential benefits of alcohol talk about alcohol in moderation, which generally means a drink a day, up to. And the problem there is an interpretation, right? So if one person's drink is this size, the next person's is that size, then that's not really the right kind of moderation. So I think that's where a lot of the real issues with alcohol come in. The other issue with alcohol is something we were just talking about a minute ago, glycemic index, glycemic load. So because of all the carbohydrate, the sugar and alcohol, that becomes inflammatory. So what I always tell people if they bring up alcohol is, you know, if you're going to drink alcohol, if nothing else, you need to kind of counterbalance with the other foods that you're going to be eating because of the nutrition, the nutritional content or carbohydrate content of the alcohol. And alcohol depletes certain nutrients like yeah. zinc and thiamine and vitamin A. And we know that zinc from the A-RED study decrease, can decrease the risk of macular degeneration. 
Yeah, so both the ARIDS-1 and 2 studies show the importance of zinc. And so the amount of zinc in ARIDS vitamins is actually 80 milligrams per day, which is a really high amount. And the only way to get that is, is through supplementation. And to your point, if so it's in, you know, it's somewhere, depending on what you read, 25 to 50% or more of Americans are, um, have insufficient zinc intake. Maybe not deficient, but at least insufficient. So if we're talking about something that makes that even worse, if we have up to half of people that don't get enough, and then if alcohol makes it even worse for something that you need extra of, then you make a really good point, yeah. And what foods contain zinc? Oh, so what foods contain zinc? So seafood does, uh, oysters do. Um, you know, to be really honest with you, I, I, I don't know exactly what uh, foods. Pumpkin contain. seeds and chocolate. So for people that are willing to, to have a raw cacao, uh, you know, you don't want milk chocolate, but you want raw chocolate because it's very good. It's very high in zinc and it, it could certainly help, uh, you know. And, the thing is other, and so that, that kind of points out, other than potentially dark chocolate, the other things like seeds and oysters and some of their seafood is not overly abundantly eaten. And so that kind of helps explain why we're just not getting a whole lot of zinc in, in the average American diet. Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Thank you for tuning in to the Open Your Eyes podcast. If you like the video you're watching, please hit the like button. Also hit subscribe for weekly new episodes of the podcast along with pod winks and bonus content. All right, let's get back to the show. And something that we need to talk about is the pigment in the back of the eye, macular pigment. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what that is, how we could measure it, and why it's important for preventing or decreasing the risk of macular degeneration. Yeah, so earlier I mentioned the 10 layers and the pigment that kind of clumps. There's actually a, even a separate type of pigment. So what you're talking of, it's called uh, macular pigment. Uh, it can be measured in the way it's measured. It, it, it's in, I guess the unit is called macular pigment optical density. So it's measuring how much of this very thin protective pigment layer that you have. The way that we develop that pigment layer for ourselves is through ingestion of certain foods that have what are called carotenoids. So the two main carotenoids are lutein and zeaxanthin, and the third is mesozeaxanthin. And these are the things that really help create this very fine pigment layer. As it turns out, most Americans' pigment layer in their eye, their macular pigment, is lower than what it needs to be to be protective. And so the way I try to describe this to patients is this macular pigment optical density, this pigment layer, is like having internal sunglasses. So it's kind of the layer in our eye that, that protects our eyes against the potential harmful lights that enter our eyes. Now we can put on sunglasses on the outside, but that's a very one dimensional approach because the only thing that sunglasses really help is protecting our eyes. But eating the right foods that have these carotenoids in it, they don't do, just do good for our eyes. Studies have shown that getting enough carotenoids in your diet is good for your heart health, your skin health, uh, and probably most importantly, what, what we're finding out more and more of now is cognitive health and helping to improve cognitive function and cognitive abilities. So, you know, what are some of the foods that have this? Well, this is why you hear eye doctors talk so frequently about green leafy vegetables. So spinach, kale, um, Swiss chard. Someone just asked me about recently. I got an email about that from somebody. Anything green and leafy is really good for your eyes. Not as good, but much more plentiful in the American diet are things like romaine lettuce and broccoli. So foods like that can be really, really helpful at building up this pigment layer that we think helps prevent against macular degeneration or it's worsening. Now, the other thing I wanna point out that's real important about this pigment layer is, you know, there are some that might argue that, well, even if you have a really healthy pigment layer, you might still develop macular degeneration. That's true. Um, so maybe some people would argue it's preventative properties, but I think beyond that is something that we absolutely know is that when people have better carotenoid ingestion, so these lutein, zeaxanthin, or potentially mesozeaxanthin, it improves quality of vision. So most 
patients, general public, just think of my vision as being 2020 or how, what, what, how big or small letters can I read on an eye chart? But the way that, that we really need to be thinking about vision is that 2020 is a quantity of vision, but it doesn't really describe the quality of your vision. So something may be huge in size, but if it's shades of gray, you may not be able to see it. That's your contrast sensitivity. Or it may be huge, but because of lights surrounding it and how light sensitive you are, you can't see it. And these are all things that are potentially improved through diet or supplementation with carotenoids. Well, they're very sensitive to the sun. We call that photophobia. Yeah. Can increasing macular pigment help that? Yeah, very often times. So what I tell people is that um, people that with low macular pigment almost always are very light sensitive. Now, not everybody that's light sensitive has low macular pigment. But again, by having someone take one of these supplements or changing and having a healthier diet with more of the green leafy vegetables doesn't hurt anybody. Now, I take that back because the, the only potential issue with green leafy vegetables might be in some people that are on blood thinners. So that may be one category of people where we may talk more about supplements than diet. But in general, healthy diet doesn't hurt anybody. And increasing the macular pigment also helps with temporal processing speed. So yeah. for athletes, kids that play baseball or te tennis. Yeah. And so there's actually um, players on every major league baseball team that take eye supplements for that purpose. They take supplements to improve. You know, for those guys, it's important to see the spin on a ball. So if a ball's coming at you at 95 miles an hour, you want to see which way it's spinning to know where to swing and to your point, the temporal processing to be able to actually follow through with that action. So there are athletes in all sorts of different sports that are taking supplements specifically for their eyes. And the main thing in these supplements are these carotenoids because of all these things that we're pointing out that they help improve. So there's far more to it than just can we prevent or prevent worsening of macular degeneration. Can we, you know, a, a term that I heard a, a visual, a vision scientist use that I really like is what we need to do is to promote visual excellence. And the way we do that is through nutrition, really. It's not just, yeah, of course, you need to have the right glasses or contacts, but if you really want to have visual excellence, then it's paying attention to these things like macular pigment and eating the right foods. For doctors that mag measure macular pigment, th that measurement that you said, that MPOD measurement, if those athletes can get their number in this 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 log, log unit number, they're going to be able to see the ball much better. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. So a lot of the patients that we check, you know, you mentioned, you know, we, a higher number is better. And so basically the highest you can get is, is basically one. Um, and so oftentimes the people that we're testing, they're, 0 0.15, 0 0.2. We get excited if someone's 0.35. But you're right that the athletes that are experiencing true visual excellence, they're 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And so, yeah, they're at less risk of macular degeneration, but their visual performance is going to be far superior because of how much better they're able to see. I interviewed Jim Stringham, who's done a lot of these studies. And he was able to take baseball players who were struggling with had low had batting averages in the low two hundreds, high one hundreds, and just by putting them on macular pigment supplementation, their hitting got much much better because they were able to see, like you said, the spin on the ball to tell if it was a curveball or it was a fastball to see how the ball was coming out of the pitcher's hand. Yeah, I've had a couple of patients that have experienced that as well, where. You know, I remember one very, very vividly where he's talking about, yeah, I play baseball and I'm going to be playing in college, but I haven't been hitting very well recently and started him on a supplement and a couple months later, dramatically changed his ability to hit the ball. So now the, the, these, whether it's through vitamins or whether it's through food, it doesn't make a difference overnight. It's not like you eat some spinach today and tomorrow you're Popeye. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work the same way as the cartoon. Uh, it generally takes at least, what I tell people is it takes at least three months um, and oftentimes six. And the, the reason that's important is because what I don't want people to do is start taking a supplement or change a lifestyle. And if a week later or a month later, they don't see a difference to get frustrated and give up. I think people need to know that it's taken a long time to beat your body down to how low it's gotten as far as functionality. 
it's going to take a little bit of time to bring it back up. And so we need to have at least a little bit of patience. You know, we talked about blue light a little bit before, and blue light is a very controversial topic within our profession. Mm -hmm. Outside our profession, in the functional medicine arena, it's not, it's not controversial. They feel very strongly that you should be blocking the blue light, coming off the computers, and that, you know, we know for sure that about sleep, how the blue light coming off the computers affects the digital devices, affects in a negative way people's sleep. But blue light, there are studies that show, especially in, in rodents, that it can damage the cells in the back of the eye. So I like your precaution, precautionary principle is why not protect against it with, blue, with filtering uh, glasses to filter out the blue light coming off the computers. Yeah, and so the other thing about the glasses is they only filter about 20% of the blue light. So it's not like we're cutting it out completely. So we probably need some. I, I don't think anyone would argue that we need some blue light. Um, but yeah, with lenses that we have available, it filters out about 20%. Um, and we can filter out even more if we have the right diet or the right supplements. And you know, I think the reason why it's controversial is to your point, there's, there's definitely rodent models that show that with enough blue light exposure, you can damage the cells in the retina. Now, someone may equate that to um, NutraSweet or aspartame being harmful if you eat, you know, ingest 30 packets a day. And that that's, you know, that same kind of principle that it takes so much. Um, so as far as damaging the eye, you're right. That's where there's some controversy. However, I think you make a, a great point that whether it's because of what we know from functional practitioners or us as optometrists should realize this, that blue light messes up someone's sleep patterns or circadian rhythm. And once you mess up someone's sleep pattern, that then puts them at risk for a whole host of chronic diseases, not to mention, you know, not the very least to mention is diabetes. And so, you know, I think it, it, it shouldn't, no one should be able to argue that blue light, we don't need to attenuate blue light at all. There may be different reasonings given, but at the very least for what it does to sleep patterns and then what that leads to. I think, that, I think that's a great point. I really do. You know, if we look at blood tests, you know, at one time, Joanna Seddon, who's done a lot of research in this area, uh, who looked at maybe homocysteine, C-reactive protein, some of our inflammatory markers as a possible blood test to see if you're at risk for macular degeneration. Now, we don't certainly do that at this point, send people out for those blood tests. But just philosophically, what do you think about that? Well, I think philosophically, it, it, it kind of goes in with what we've been talking about, inflammation, because the markers you're talking about are all inflammatory markers. And so if we're under the assumption that AMD is an inflammatory-based disease, then it should make sense that inflammatory markers might be elevated. Now, unfortunately, it's not that simple. There's you know, macular degeneration is a fairly complex disease process where there's no one magic answer. It's not, well, if we just look at C-reactive protein or just homocysteine or just genetics for that matter, that that's the key. Again, I go back to the idea of a puzzle with so many different pieces. So I think blood work could be pieces in a puzzle. I think at least at this time, they're fairly small pieces in the big puzzle. Um, they may explain, we may ultimately find out that it's an interlinking or combination of things like the, the blood markers plus genetics plus something else is what equals risk. So philosophically, I think that, yeah, all those things make sense. They're of some value. I just don't know that we yet know how to use them functionally and create maximal value from the information. What's your view on genetic testing for macular degeneration and the concept of epigenetics? Yeah. So it's funny because genetic testing is it, it's actually a very controversial thing in macular degeneration. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which is kind of the, uh, not parent organization, but organized ophthalmology, has a position statement saying that it recommends against doing genetic testing in complex disease processes, multifactorial, which macular degeneration is. But I think that that may be a little bit short-sighted or myopic in how we look at genetic testing. So 
not really nobody would argue that we can use genetics to determine who's at greater risk of developing macular degeneration or of people that have it, who's at risk of developing worsening of or wet macular degeneration. So I try, I try to employ genetics in the vast majority of my patients that have AMD. I do genetic testing. It's a simple cheek swab. Um, it's easy to do. It ends up being affordable for patients. And so I'm an advocate for doing genetic testing. The place where there's um, a lot of controversy is whether you can tell, uh, so pharmacogenetics. So whether you can tell what pharmaceutical or um, supplements you should use based on genetics. So there's a number of different studies, some that say that genetics is everything in determining how you respond to supplements. And there's a different author group that says genetics means nothing when it comes to determining how you respond to supplements. And my take is genetics are important. They help to uh, determine who responds to supplements. But I think where, we, where the gap is, is we don't yet know exactly how much. So we, I think that there's enough evidence to say that genetics are certainly relevant. We just don't yet know enough to say, well, here's the absolute answer of what we do because of the genetics. I, I've been saying this for a while, but I'll continue to say it. I think five years from now, so I've been saying this for probably 10 years, but I think five years from now, the majority of what we do as far as supplements and macular degeneration, and maybe in other things as well, will ultimately be guided by genetics. And we're talking about zinc, really. Yeah. Because well, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's not just zinc. So the same groups, um, the, the same main group that said that genetics drives response to zinc would also contend the same it can be said about antioxidants. So one set of genetic markers determines your uh, response to zinc, and another determines your response to antioxidants. So that for some people, they should be on zinc only, some antioxidants only, some should be on both. And for some people, it may not matter, nothing's gonna make a difference. But there is a genetic test that says that if you take zinc, it can make your macular degeneration worse. Right, yeah, but, but it's that same one that will tell you the same thing for antioxidants. So it, it's, it, there's a lot of interesting nuances to it. But yeah, the, the, there's, the potential is out there to do testing um, to try to determine which way to go with supplements. Excellent, excellent. I appreciate that. Now, if somebody's at risk for wet macular degeneration, there is new technology that somebody could use at home to, that can notify their doctor that their dry macular degeneration is becoming wet. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's re I think it's really important technology that does not get used enough. So as you point out, it's a digital device that you have at home. Uh, it's called 4C Home, uh, and the company that makes it's called Notal Vision. And it's been shown in studies to help catch conversion from dry to wet macular degeneration at an earlier point and allow people, once they receive their treatment, to do better because it's caught earlier. Um, what we know about wet macular degeneration is the best predictor of how well you, do, you will do with treatment is what's your vision when you start treatment for wet macular degeneration. So this is a device that you look into. It's almost like, it's a little device that sits on a, a desktop or a countertop. You look into it and it shows you some little lines that you click on with a mouse. And so you basically map out your vision. And patients do this at least twice a week. That's at least what's approved FDA up to every day. And then reports, then the, the tests are read at a, basically using artificial intelligence at a, at a remote digital reading center. And if my patient then strays from normal on consecutive days, I get, a, I get an email saying, you know, you need to call Dr. Gelb. He's had a change in his vision. He should probably come to your office to get checked out. So I, you know, I have, I have a couple dozen patients that are doing this. And, you know, not only does it help catch conversion earlier, but I think it really gives people peace of mind because what we're able to explain to them is, boy, if you have a change for the worse, this will catch it early and now you don't need to worry about it. Because normally if you're coming to see me every six months, every four months, there's a long time in between. A lot of things can happen. But now you're essentially being tested. You're in my office daily. And so it helps give people peace of mind. The other thing that I'll point out to the viewers is that um, this is something that's covered by Medicare. 
And the majority of people that do this, that have Medicare, don't pay a penny for it. So I ask my patients all the time, you know, hey, how much do you pay for this? And oftentimes the answer I get is, you know, I, I, they don't bill me for it. I tried reaching out to them to make sure. And, and I tell them, well, don't, you know, don't mess with a good thing. If, if, they're not, if you're not paying anything, don't ask any questions. But for most people, it literally doesn't cost anything to have this incredible insurance policy. Now, this is incredible because the old way of doing it was what we called an Amsler grid. Yeah, which is, you know, what I tell people is Amsler grid is, um, is, is oftentimes not, not any better than nothing. And that it's sometimes better than nothing. And the reason is, is an Amsler grid, for anyone that's seen it, it's, uh, it's kind of like your shirt, Dr. Gallup. It's got checks on it, right? It's a bunch of horizontal and vertical lines. And what you're supposed to do is look at the very center of it with one eye at a certain distance without it moving and see if there are any changes from the day before. And the test is fraught with difficulties because if you have both eyes open, if it's moving, if it's not the right distance, then it's not very accurate. And so that's why it's, it's, sometimes it's not better than nothing. Because if you take the test incorrectly, it could give you a false sense of security. Whereas with this 4C home, it is a very objective calculated test where you can't really trick it. And so it's so much more sensitive. It's so much more accurate. So let's talk about once a patient is identified at higher risk for macular degeneration, what we could do. Let's start first with the SA, the SAD diet, the SAD diet, the standard American diet. Yeah. So, you know, and this is a conversation. You know, I, I was doing a webinar for eye doctors uh, the other day and somebody said, well, why don't you, why don't we just talk to everybody about diet and about the foods they eat? Because wouldn't that be beneficial for everybody? not just macular degeneration patients. And the, and the reality is, yeah, it would be. It's just a matter of time and priority with each individual person that we're, that we're able to interact with. But I think number one, if someone has macular degeneration, actually number one is if you smoke, quit smoking. Because if you continue to smoke, any step you take forward, you're still taking two or three steps backwards because of the smoking. So I think that's absolutely number one. Number two is diet. And that the, the standard American diet is sad. Not, not just that's the, you know, the, the, the initials for it. It's, it's sad. It's, it's not good. And so more fruits, more vegetables, um, better quality foods make a difference. And so that's, it's an important conversation that I touch on with all my patients. Yeah, I mean, there was a study done in 2019 that was published in Lancet that that forget about the eye that one fifth of the deaths that people have is from a poor diet and that over 90% of the population is deficient in at least one nutrient. Yeah. Yeah. And so just some other stats to throw out, throw out at you is that the um, leading source of antioxidants in the average American's diet is coffee. It's not because coffee is so helpful. It's because Americans don't eat enough fruits and vegetables uh, that potatoes or account for about, or French fries or account for about a third of vegetable intake in the US. Potato plus tomato is around 50% of vegetable, fruit and vegetable intake. Um, and on average, if you look at the numbers, about a third of Americans eat at a fast food establishment on a daily basis. And so, you know, you could pick out any one of those and it's sad, you put all those together and it just, it just shows you, going to your earlier question, what's different from 100 years ago, that's what's different. So what percentage of the population follow the four basic health principles? And if you could review the four basic health principles. Yeah, so it's staggering. So, um, so the four basic health principles that, you're, that you bring up, are, we've kind of already mentioned them. So healthy diet, so having enough servings of fruits and vegetables, exercising regularly, which maybe exercising is a bad word, getting some physical activity, not smoking, and not being obese. It's about 3% of Americans do all those together. Now, I actually read a more recent article, and it may be a little higher than that, depending on which age group and other demographics. So women of a certain um, age of, that live in a certain area or whatever, there may be some pockets that are a little bit higher. But the bottom line is in the paper that I read, 
I don't think there was any subset of the population where there was more than 7% that did those four healthy lifestyle habits. So it, it's an appallingly low number. Um, and that's why it makes it so important to know that and to be able to discuss that with people. And before we talked about uh, the plant pigments that are protective carotenoids, uh, what percentage of the population actually has something with lutein on a daily basis? Well, if you say what percentage of the population gets any lutein, that's probably fairly high. But I think the more telling statistic is we know that to be preventative of advanced macular degeneration, so the very atrophic or the wet kind, we need to get at least six milligrams a day. And what we know is the average American, depending on the study, gets between 0.5 and two milligrams per day. So anywhere, you know, at best on average, we're getting a third of what we need. And so not nearly enough. And the other thing that's really important when we're talking about lutein is a lot of times on, on multivitamins. So, you know, major brand multivitamins that are marketed to seniors, sometimes on the packaging, it says with lutein. And the, I think the reason it says with lutein is because lutein is a fairly well-known um, uh, thing to many people because they've heard about it from eye doctors or from studies and mainstream news outlets. So people are aware, general population is aware that lutein is of some importance. So the, the scary thing though, is that these vitamins that say with lutein, the average consumer assumes, well, it has lutein in it. It's really good for my eyes. So I don't need to really worry about my diet. I'm getting my lutein and my multivitamin. The problem is the multivitamin has one quarter of one milligram. That's what's in most of the vitamins. Now, if you look at the label, it looks like there's a lot because it doesn't say one quarter of one milligram. It says 250 micrograms. 250 looks like a big number, right? But it's not. It's, it's, it's enough to put it on the label. It's not enough to do any good. And that's a trap that a lot of people fall into. There's different diets, paleo, keto, Mediterranean, vegan. What do you think is the best? Is there a best? And what do you personally like to follow? Yeah, so when you say, is, you know, is there or which one's the best? My answer to that is yes. And the reason my answer is yes is because anybody that comes to me and is, subscribes to any of the above or considering any of the above, that tells me they're paying attention. So the best kind of diet is one where someone's paying attention. And if you know any, if someone knows any of those terms and is doing any of those, it's better than the, than the standard American diet. Uh, some recent publication is pointing to Mediterranean diet possibly being the best for macular degeneration, or at the very least, definitively being beneficial. The, the more um, parts of a Mediterranean diet that somebody is able to follow, the better off they are when it comes to macular degeneration. So is there a clear winner amongst those? I don't know there's a clear winner. I think, again, based on most recent literature, I would lean toward Mediterranean. Uh, what do I do? So I'm kind of a mishmash of a couple. Um, I actually, so interestingly, after going to one of your meetings, so, I mean, I remember this, and you could probably tell me the year it happened. Um, it was in uh, Key Largo, Florida, and it was a meeting that you put on, and there was a functional psychiatrist there that was talking about lifestyle interventions. And I was actually gonna be the speaker. She was the speaker for the morning, I was the speaker for the afternoon. And I hadn't been to one of your meetings before, so I decided, well, there's this weird looking speaker. I, I don't really know, or I'm not sure I care what she's talking about, but I'm gonna go sit in because I wanna gauge the audience. I wanna know what my audience is gonna be like so I know how to interact with them. And so I showed up when she started, and four hours later, I was just, like in awe because I, I listened to her. While I was sitting there listening to her, I went online and bought her book. And after buying her book and reading it, I very much follow um, the ideals that, that she puts forth. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a mishmash. I don't eat red meat or pork. I don't eat dairy or gluten. And so I don't know exactly what you call that. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a mix of Mediterranean, semi-vegetarian or maybe pescatarian. I, I, I try to do what I call eating healthy. That's great. So if we look at... So you changed my life for me. Well, that was, and by the way, that was Kelly Brogan. Uh, yeah. She's a, yeah. uh, 
a functional psychiatrist. And she's it's, a fantastic it's, lecturer. She's it's a fantastic what, I, speaker. what I do now is, is my patients with macular degeneration or any of my patients that talk to me about weight loss or when I talk to them about exercise and weight loss and they say they've tried, I tell them about her book. And because, and whether it's her book or something similar to it, there's another book that I like called The Plan by the author of that is uh, Lynn, Lynn Recetus. Um, I think there's lots of good books out there that help guide people on what types of foods they could or should be eating and what types of lifestyle choices they can or should be making because it makes all the difference. And what I hear all too often from people is my doctor told me to lose weight or my doctor told me to go on a diet and it was left at that. Right. And that's, that's not giving someone the tools they need to accomplish their goal. So I think it's important that if, if I'm giving you a goal, I want to give you the tools that you need to accomplish that goal. You know, like Grain Brain or Wheat Belly, those are really good books as yeah. well. Yeah, all of these, are, they're fantastic. So we know that when somebody eats foods with lutein or zeaxanthin in it, you know, my favorite foods with zeaxanthin, I like goji berries, you know, orange and yellow peppers for lutein and zeaxanthin, you know, so these are some of the foods in addition to the green leafy vegetables, eggs, you know, there's been some good studies on eggs. An egg a day, an egg a day keeps uh, wet AMD away. That's it, you know, so, you and, know. And it's, so oranges and apples, as it turns out. So let's talk about being able to absorb the food. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people, as they get older, they may eat the right foods. And, you know, spinach from one part of the country maybe have different amount of nutrients than spinach from a different part of the world, you know, because of the, the, because of the soil and the nutrients they're putting in the soil and the way they, you know, the, you know, are they putting NPK or is it all 52 minerals? But we need to absorb it. And... If you look at the studies, there's been some real good studies that show that the more that you have the lutein and the zeaxanthin in the serum, which means you're absorbing it better, the more you'll be able to decrease the risk of macular degeneration. As high as 93% with zeaxanthin and over 70% with lutein and even a lower risk of cataracts. So what can we do to help us absorb these nutrients after we eat them a little bit better? Yeah, so one of the things is, like with a lot of other nutrients, is to have some fat along with them. So, you know, people that, so the, the biggest potential pitfall of eating salad is loading it up with cheese and bacon and really fattening dressing and all these things that add tons and tons of fat and calories. However, that being said, eating a salad with zero fat probably doesn't do you as much good as having a dressing that does have some fat or having some avocado in it or seeds that have some fat because that fat helps you to absorb or better use the nutrients, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're taking in. So, but you bring up a really important point. It's not just what are you eating, but what are you eating? What are you eating with it? How are you eating it is, is also really, really important. Let's talk about some other supplements. How about omega-3s? Yeah, so omega-3, you know, the, the biggest study that eye doctors will refer to, biggest recent study, something called ERICS-2, and it didn't show any benefit to omega-3s. Um, there was a European study at the same time that showed omega-3 was important. Different ratios of EPA and DHA. My answer to that is eat cold water fatty fish. Uh, again, going back to the foods and not just the supplements. So I think if you eat a serving or two a week of cold water fatty fish, that does you a lot of good. And again, I think that there's not a doctor that would argue that. There's no one that's gonna say, well, getting a little bit of, of fish is bad for you. It's an important part of a Mediterranean diet. And how about vitamin D? Vitamin D is another really important one. Um, you know, there's, there's actually been a couple studies that show that vitamin D may not be important, but there's more that show that it is. Again, just like everything else, vitamin D appears to be important, not just for macular degeneration, but also for diabetes, uh, MS, uh, lots of other chronic inflammatory-based diseases. And if your homocysteine is high, how about B complex? Yeah. So again, you know, it's it's almost like we need to be adding in all these different things. But you're right; it's it's really important. And you know, even adding in B complex may or may not be enough, because for some people, B complex means taking in folate, and for some people, that doesn't do them any good. They need methylfolate. It needs to be methylated. So you know, all these are interesting questions that 
Um, you know, it's easy to give a bullet point answer, but they could all be 10, 15 minute discussions. Um, and that's why it's so important to take control of what it is you're eating and how you're supplementing because there's so many little facets to it that can make a big difference. Well, let's talk about the future. Where are we going with macular degeneration prevention? What are some of the things that we may see down the road within five years to help our patients? Yeah, I think the, the biggest changes, I think in the next five years, um, if, I'm, if I'm hopeful, if I'm being overly optimistic, there'll be some that are genetics based. Um, so figuring out who either is at risk or who benefits from certain supplements or treatments. Um, I think that the treatments for wet macular degeneration in the next five years will be better because of the mode of delivery. It will be less burdensome for patients. Um, there are clinical trials looking at people that have dry macular degeneration and what can we do to prevent it from converting or even improve vision when they have it. One of the really interesting things to me is something called photobiomodulation. And so it's basically using light to modulate or change activity of cells, to change uh, metabolism within cells. And so it's not as easy as, but the idea is looking at a light of a certain wavelength, whether it's something crude that you buy, you know, off, off somewhere online that you stare at, at the right frequency of light. You don't want to use a laser and burn a hole in your eye, but looking at the correct frequency of light, just, you know, something really inexpensive or a very fine tuned objective uh, piece of equipment in the office where you look into it and it, it uses a very specific wavelength of light that's emitting to your eyes to help treat macular degeneration. That's something that I'm really excited about. There's a phase three clinical trial going on in the US right now. Um, photobiomodulation is already being used in Europe and the UK um, for treating people with dry macular degeneration with some success. So to me, that's, that's probably the most exciting short-term thing because there already appears to be some benefit shown. And what excites me about something like that is it's pretty easy to do. It's very low risk. So it's low burden with potential for reward. No, oh, that's fantastic. So if you were going to summarize our discussion today for the people that are watching, what are some of the, in summary, what can they do to decrease their risk? Yeah, so the most summarized way I can give it to you is be healthy. Um, because it just, it all goes together. I think uh, have a healthy diet which means more green leafy vegetables, less refined carbohydrates. I think ideally something closer to a Mediterranean style diet and engage in the different activities that all your doctors bring up to you. Exercising some, um, not smoking and not being obese. You know, interestingly, other doctors talk about those things, but oftentimes when other doctors talk about those things, somebody says, eh, I'll take my chances, right? If a doctor says, well, I want you to do these things so you don't develop fill in the blank. The reaction almost universally is, I'll take my chances. But as you mentioned in the opening of this segment, you mentioned how much people fear losing vision. And so a message from your eye doctor saying, you know, you might want to consider doing these things because of something that affects your eyes and your vision. I think it's potentially more impactful. So that's why, again, it just comes back to be healthy. The healthier you are, I, I think the less likely you are to be affected by macular degeneration or diabetes, high blood pressure, thyroid disease, anything else you want to fill in the blank with. I want to thank Dr. Jeff Gerson for joining me today. If people want to find out more about you, how can they do that? Find out more about me? There's not that much to find <laughs> out about, Dr. Gelb. I don't know. Uh, I guess what they could do is, is uh, they could go to my, uh, the practice that I'm in website, grineyecare.com. Uh, that might be one way. Um, but, I, you know, I'm kind of an interesting guy. I'm not on Facebook. I don't have my own website. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of kind of quiet into myself. Well, I really appreciate your wealth of knowledge. You've got a great personality. Thank you for sharing this information with my audience, with the public, and helping them because people need help uh, knowing about macular degeneration and the potential of decreasing the risk from going blind because we, we don't want to see our patients go blind. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I applaud your efforts. You know, when I, when I first saw your movie, Open Your Eyes, it did open my eyes. And it, 
I think that your ongoing podcast series is just, it's a great thing because there's so many of these, these factors within medicine that are a little bit outside the box, but that's just because of how we perceive them. They really are the box and they're not outside the box at all. It's the most important stuff that you're bringing to people's attention. So thank you for doing this. And thank you for, for everybody out there until next time. Uh, this is Dr. Kerry Gelb for the podcast, Open Your Eyes. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I like to bring extra, and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You, because it's safe for me and you.